uh, for just last come together, just, just to hear your word and what you have for us today. Give us new revelation, Holy Spirit. Show us Jesus in every which way possible. Show me ways that maybe I haven't, I haven't seen this week that you know maybe just come flowing out. You know, and give people, each one in here just whatever they need. Allow him to see him as their need, and then their answer, and, and bringing them to completion whatever the, the situation is going through. And that you know, I pray that each person as they leave out, they'll be thinking of Jesus now themselves, and just be magnified to Him, and may that go out throughout the week when we're not in here gathered together with as individuals as we're out there, and that they just see Jesus in every which way possible. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. So. We got finally got through the book of Hebrews, which took forever in the day. I think it, a month and a half, roughly. So we're going to start this new one, um, In Christ. I know it sounds great. It sounds simple. But we're going to be going from the book, going to the first two chapters of the book of Ephesians. Okay? Because Paul laid out so poetic, I think it's one of the most poetic written letters, in that he lays out what it means to be in Christ. And I want you to notice something that... In that, when he's writing these first two chapters, if you didn't know that the book, the epistles never had chapters in the first place, okay? they were there for us to help study. It helps us to study. But the first two, the first two chapters actually is one continued in context. It's one continued statement that he's making. Okay, now you get into three and four is kind of continuation. It's a different topic, but it kind of brings it a little more deeper and goes off to a little different stuff. He addresses different things. But the first two chapters is what it means to be in Christ. Okay. It's pretty deep and rich because Paul writes so much in him, in Christ. God put you in Christ. You, he puts you in him. And I think it's so beautiful, and I think we feel to realize a lot of stuff there. And as we go about our daily lives, we don't realize of who we are in Christ. Now, spring forward next week, we're going to start talking about the gospel. And that because you're in Christ, I want you to know which gospel is to be betrayed out. And that there's an uh, adulterated gospel going out there, which means it's been tainted. And then I want you to start hearing the right gospel. And we're going to start talking a lot about that. But we're going to talk, focus today in, in Christ. Now, you're going to notice two things in here, which I find to be beautiful. And, and so, is that the first two chapters, once you get into it, once Paul starts to really get into it, it's actually one continuous sentence in the Greek. Which actually, in the first chapters, from verse 3 all the way to 14, it's one continuous sentence in the Greek. Amazing. It's like a run on sentence, which I love. Because if you ever knew me in high school and in college, I made tons of run-off sentences in my, my stories and stuff like that. And I loved it, and the teachers hated me. So, anyways, they loved the red marker on me. But he also does the same thing in chapter 2. And so we kind of see that, too. I kind of forget what verses it goes, but there's another one in there, too. So let's get started. I love this chapter. I love this topic. I love the Ephesians. I love the first parts of it because it's just so, so awesome. And I think he just paints a beautiful picture of you and I and what God really did and what he did in Christ. So let's start out. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the divine will to the saints. By the way, the word saints means holy ones, concentrated, set apart. So you're all saints. There's not it, it, Catholics holy, try to dub somebody as a saint, but you're all saints in God's eyes. At Ephesus, which is not using, the, is not in the original translate, the word, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians was actually written to the Ephesians church to be passed up to the local churches too, in the original letter. Who are also faithful and loyal and steadfast in Christ Jesus, made grace and spiritual peace, which means peace with God and harmony, unity, and undis undisturbedness, be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to get right into this beautiful part. He gets his little greeting, he kept it short. Sometimes Paul keeps it a little long sometimes. He likes to just talk about it. Paul was talking, your pastor was talking too, so if I had an introduction, it'd probably be like 20 verses, but he kept it short here, only two verses for his introduction. Why? He has a lot to get into, because this is where he begins his run on sentence. So, may blessing be to, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Notice that in Christ, God has already given you everything. And then let that sink in. We, 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 sometimes we go to God and we ask so much for things, right? But God says, I have already given it to you in Christ. And it, I know a lot of people get stumbled on the first part that there. It says every spiritual blessing. We're like, spiritual? That doesn't mean here. Actually, not true. Everything gives birth from the spiritual realm to be into the physical realm, 
right? It has to be first put in the spiritual realm to be here, right? Yeah. It then be manifested. So God gave you actually the best thing, the spiritual blessing, okay? And it's to work itself out whenever you need it. In John 1, 17 or 1, 16, it says that we receive grace upon grace. It means that God's grace brings out everything you need each and every day. It's, it's upon grace. It's a wave after wave after grace. Whatever you need is there's a fresh grace there which brings out what he's already put in you. He's obligated himself to this. This is God. Not you doing it. He does it. Now, he will lead you, guide, and see the manifestation of what he's already put in you to see it outwardly. Okay? I'm the testimony in this because, man, <laughs> we've been through some stuff, and I can tell you, God is bringing it out what he's already put in. So you can rest in the fact of who you are in Christ, that you have everything. Your finances come up short, you already have it in Christ. You may need an answer to a, 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 a very hot, hot question that's going on in your life. God says, I already given it to you. I already blessed you with it. You need a new car? Because your car is going, gone, it's going dead. He says, I already got you a new car. He's already gave it to you. When he gave you Jesus, he gave you everything, right? Because if he held back anything from you, he would deem it higher than who Jesus really is, right? And Jesus is the highest, is the best. He gave you heaven's best. So, notice the first of all, you get the, I love how he starts out with that, because I think it's probably was one of the biggest questions that we have as a Christian, of who we are in Christ is, do we have everything? And Paul starts out and says, yes. Oh, the first answer is yes. So, let's go to verse 4. I love this part. Even as in his love he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own, of his own, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in his sight, even above reproach before him in love. Notice that he chose you. Before he created anything, he chose you and destined you to be in Christ. He handpicked you. If you, if you, how, how many of y'all played basketball before or played sports? And they're dividing up the teams. And when your buddy or friend picked you on his team, it made you feel pretty special, didn't it? I was one of those kids that got kind of always at the end sometimes. Depends on the sport and what we're doing. If it was basketball, I was always last because they do it. I couldn't shoot. Could barely dribble sometimes. If it was baseball, I was always picked one of the first top ones. It made me feel special, right? So God wants you to know he picked you. He chose you. And the funny thing is, before the foundation world, before you could do anything bad in your entire life, even though he knew you were going to make mistakes, he still chose you. He didn't just choose you, he put you in Christ. He put your destiny in Christ. And we'll see that until the next verse. But he chose you to be in Christ because of his love for you. That speaks of redemption. He knew you were going to fall. But he put you in Christ so that you can be holy and blameless in his sight. That should be, and the Greek means that when you're in Christ, you're holy and blameless. That's who you are. And God sees you holy and blameless. I think that's so beautiful, so elegant. That kind of, man, if you, you mess up, are you not scared to go sometimes to God? Or are, are we ashamed sometimes? Do we think God looks down upon us? Because we, we kind of look at that relationship we have with our human beings. When we mess up, they look down upon us. But God doesn't. He actually holds you up high. He says, you're holy and blameless in my sight. It gives you kind of more comfort that comes to him. Now imagine these Ephesians maybe had trouble, or even the churches around them had trouble with thinking that when they messed up, man, they were scared of coming before God. And he had to set them kind of straight. He said, hey, you're holy and blameless in Christ. He handpicks you. He chose you. You're the best. He chose you. He's beautiful. Now he said, he for, for he ordained us, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted as his own children through Jesus Christ. In accordance with the purpose of his will, because it pleased him and was kind intent. Notice that it was his will for you to be a son, a daughter, to be adopted through Christ. That was his will. You, if you ever want to know his will, his will for you to be in Christ. Period. That's it. That's God's will for you to believe on his son, that you can be adopted as a son or daughter of his, that you may have sonship with God now, not servanthood or servantness, as people say, but sonship. He operates with us through sonship. Okay? Different. Now, I like this part. Because it pleased him. He's pleased 
when you accept your destiny. Wow. He's pleased. We think doing the praying enough, reading our Bibles enough, you know, you know, feeding the poor enough, you know, just always saying the right things or doing always the right thing pleases him. He says, no, it pleased him when he put you in Christ. When you accept that destiny of yours, he's pleased. It was his kind intent. It satisfied his love for you. That's how you start to see you start to see the deepness of his love when you start to see who you are in Christ. He starts to articulate. Now I want you to notice one thing. It never says anything about you to do or done. Notice it's always it's talking about here. God did. God did. God did. God put you. God chose you. God ordained you. God blessed you with everything. It's God and not us. We're removed from the situation, from the equation. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Right? Six, so that we might be to the praise and commendation of his glorious grace, which he so freely bestowed on us in the blood. He put us in Christ so that we could be the great praise and glory to him. He put us in Christ. You say, well, well I have to praise and glorify him now. No, he said, it pre- praise, we are in Christ, we are the praise and glory to him. Period. Period. Being in him makes praise and glory to him. And we sit here and say, you know, doing praise and worship. Man, I have to glorify God. I have to glorify God in everything. He says, first, I want you to realize this. If you really, truly want to do it, you have to understand the first thing is what? By being in Christ, you have praise and glory to him. Period. Now, believe that. You can rest on it. Now you'll see the manifestation outwardly. He bought, Paul is really building these people at the church up. to show who they really are. Because when you believe right, you will actually do right. It will be a natural reaction out of you. What's already been put in you. Now, also, too, here, you might have your King James or New King James that says accepted, right? Accepted into the beloved, which actually means highly favored in the beloved. We know the beloved is Jesus Christ, right? Because God never once said anybody else to be his beloved in the whole entire Bible until Jesus went into the, and was baptized in the Jordan River and said, This is my beloved son, right? So we know that we're in Christ. You're in the beloved. You're highly favored. What does that mean? That God highly favors you. That means in every situation, you're highly favored. It means that when God favors you, or in this case, highly favors you, what can man do to you? What can the devil do to you if God himself is highly favors you? No. It's time to change their mindsets. Imagine there's pretty much a lot of stuff going on in that church. Or surround the church. You remember they had Judaizers coming in there. They had a lot of people in there trying to taint them and trying to tell them who they are and what they had to do. But I love how he says that he favors you. So I know y'all in school, a couple of people got in here still at school. God highly favors you in your classes in every subject. What does that mean? He's on your side. It means he's going to get it done. You can just rest, relax. Trying to study, trying to stay up all night, right? Just rest. Just rest. He'll lead you to, to see the words, right? He'll lead you to study the right parts. He'll, when that answer comes up, he's the one who will help bring it out of you. Right? You're highly favored. That's who you are. It means all of God's goodness is directed towards you. In him, we have redemption. Notice, in him, in Christ, we have redemption. Now, this is the word redemption, which means ransom. We know that it comes from this word ransom. It means he became you. That he ransomed himself means he bought you with a price. When these Ephesians heard this, think about this. When the church heard of that day, we, we kind of just kind of bypassed the word redemption, right? When they heard this in the Greek, they understood it means that you were bought with a price. God bought you back. That means somebody had to die. It meant, means more when you understand that it means bought with a price. Jesus bought you back with his blood. It's hard to see your value. Took him. It's, you start to see your value. You start to see God, how God hand picked you. He ordained you. He made you accepted or highly favored in the blood. Now he bought you back. He paid the price. Through his blood, the remission, it says forgiveness here, means to omit, to be forgiven. Okay, it says forgiveness. That you have, you have been forgiven means you have forgiveness always means you walk in a realm of forgiveness. 
Now notice that it says two of your offenses in accordance with, now this is where we get mixed up. We always try to say when I confess, when I do something right, when I pray right, it always comes to something that we do, right? Right? It's always according to if we walk in forgiveness, it's because we did something right, right? But here it says, with the riches and the generosity of his gracious, or his favor, or actually in the Greek says, his grace. According to the richness of his grace, you have forgiveness, that you can walk in forgiveness. You can walk as a forgiven person, no matter the situation, no matter what you do wrong, that you're still forgiven in his sight. I know sometimes people take that back and says, man, you're just telling them they can go out and just do whatever they want to, right? You give them a license to go out and do what they want. You tell me, when you know that you have been forgiven, does it not make, make you realize how much God loves you? To look past, what, not he didn't look past, he actually paid the price. That, that forgiveness actually sets you free. Jesus said to the woman caught in Dutch Street, he didn't say, I condemn you now, and I go confess your sins, for I can forgive you. And he says, I condemn you not. It means I forgive you. It means I'm not punishing you. Because of that, you don't have to sin anymore. You don't have to play the adultery anymore. It's kind of interesting. I think it's more or less the story of the church. That's that story is more or less the church. We've been playing the adultery. We've been in the sin because we've been mixed in the law. And stand before God and we feel guilty and he says I don't condemn you you don't have to live that anymore come out but notice it's through his grace still not you you're still not doing anything I love this still haven't done a thing now this part so he riches of grace watch this I love this part which he lavish or this makes God the prodigal makes him the prodigal not the prodigal son in the Bible in the in with the uh, parable says this makes him the, the prodigal because it means lavishly he laughs upon in every kind of wisdom and understanding what is wisdom and understanding the richness of his grace Jesus Christ that's wisdom it's not about trying to do stuff right or what it's actually his grace the fullness of his grace is wisdom and understanding the book of Proverbs is really about Jesus Christ, if you look at it right. If you don't see Jesus, you're not reading it right. Because you can sit there and say, the, right, the, the blessings upon the head of the righteous. You read that, oh, I got to do right. That actually means you're standing before God. Are you not in Christ? Well, you're righteous. This means God's blessings upon you. you got to look in the eyes of the cross. But this wisdom, he, he lavished it upon you. He poured it out on you and I. And all this wisdom and understanding so we can learn of him. We can learn who Jesus truly is. We can really truly see who our God really is. How much he actually loves us and what he did for us. You know, actually you start to peel the back. You start peeling away and you start seeing that love. Man, does it not make your heart burn within you? Does it not make you want to keep peeling it back even more and learn more of God? This grace, it does. It actually makes you love him more. And we, we want to say, you have to love God. We put that on so many people. God says, I just want you to see Jesus. And it becomes a response. It comes a response to love him back. Just as the woman who entered into the Pharisee's house, broke open the, the ointment, the expensive ointment, anointed Jesus, wiped his feet with her, washed or tear her tears, and wiped his feet, her, his feet with her hair. She wasn't even conscious that she was loving on Jesus so much. It was just a response of seeing his grace. That's it. That's it. So you want people to be on fire for God? Show them Jesus. Start help peel back those layers of his love for you. Now notice this. Making known to us the mystery of his will. And it is this. This is his will. In accordance with his good pleasure, which he had previously purposed and set forth in him, he planned for the maturity of times and the climax of the ages to unify all things, and hid them up and consummate them in Christ. Both things in heaven and things on the earth. God's will is put everything in Christ. That's his will. You don't have to sit here and search your whole entire life for it. His will is put everything in Christ. That is God's plan. To be holy and blameless in his sight. He's to repeat what he said before. This is God's will. You to be in Christ. That's it. 
We all looking for a purpose in life, right? We all search. May I say all kinds of stuff. Alcohol, it came to everything, trying to find that purpose. The purpose was to what? Be in Christ. That completes you. That gives you completion. In him, we also were made God's heritage. And we obtained an inheritance. For we have been foreordained in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will. He works it out to his will. How many of us try to make, make it work out to his will? He said he makes it work out. He makes this inheritance that he has given to you work out for his will. He does it. Still not you and I. There's nothing there. Okay? Paul's going to show us something that we did, that we done. And I think this is the amazing part. But it's not going to be what you think. So that we first hoped in Christ, who first put our confidence in him, had been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his Lord. We live today for the praise of his Lord. I think that's amazing. We walk today as the praise of his glory. Everything we do is, is his praise of his glory. When he sees you, he sees what his son has done, and he is glorified, period. Now, guess what that does? Now, what does that free you to do? It frees you to go out and do the right thing. When you know you freely can fail, you can actually freely succeed. Okay? I think it's amazing. You ever seen trampoline artists? Tightrope artists? They don't do so well when there's nothing underneath them. When there's no net to catch them, man, they, it's a boring show. But when there's a net there, they do some of the most magnificent things you've ever seen before. Man, you're like, how in the world do they ever do that? It's because they know they can freely fail. They can freely fall off and they still live. Without the net there, they fall off, they're dead. Done. They had all the people screaming out, run out the door, screaming. <laughs> right? So they're very cautious about what they do. But when you, give, you lift that and give them freedom, it's beautiful. Well, same thing for you and I in Christ. In him, why is this? In him, in Christ. Also, you also have heard the word of truth. Now, he wrote, the word truth is symbolized with the gospel. It's the word truth. You know when he says, that you shall hear the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The gospel is what sets you free. The gospel. Nothing else. You will bring change to the situation. Bring the gospel into your situation. The gospel. Now we're going to talk about next week because actually you see it hidden so much in the Bible, actually in the Old Testament, actually them actually speaking the gospel out. You see it hidden, foreshadowed, them speaking out. And the enemies just fall in doom. The enemies of the Israel coming against them just are defeated with the preaching of the gospel. So beautiful. And so it blew my mind away when I was, when I was seeing it, when God showed me it. And so it's the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in, and adhered to, and relied on him, were stamped with a seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit. It depends on your translation. You become one with the Holy Spirit. You actually are now one with God. You're not trying to be. You are. It means when God sees it, he sees no difference between him and himself, and you and him. You're one. You're holy and blameless in his sight. You're just like he is holy and blameless. You're one with him. If he sees you like that, there's nothing you can do to you know, change it. He did it. He did it. If it's not your doing that produces it, then it's not your doing that can undo it. Because God stamps it. He says he stamps it. Bam! Stamp. Done. Sealed. Done deal. This is our promise. We've been promised the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that it's our down payment to what's to come. God's giving us a taste of what it's going to be like. That's why I know some of us, we look in this world, man, we're like, this is a horrible world to live in. Why are we here? I might as well all be dead. I know Paul even struggled with that. He says, to be, to, not to be out of the body is to be with Christ, but to be here is for your sake. You know what kept him here was the fact that this was the Holy Spirit. He got the down payment. He got that down payment. He started seeing his hope. He started seeing, I can have heaven here on earth today. Today, I can experience God's goodness here, even in the midst of this all this chaos. That's what gives you and I hope. That's what makes me get up every morning. Because believe me, CNN doesn't do that. CNN makes me go call my bed, and close my eyes, and cry. Yes, a grown man crying. All right, 
That spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. It tells us that we have been bought with a price, that we are in Christ, that God has given us everything. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to tell us. That's what he's here for. He symbolizes all God's goodness that you have. That's what the Holy Spirit is here. The first fruits. I love that. The first fruits. When, anytime you read in the Old Testament talking about first fruits, it's talking about it's actually a symbolize of the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit. Symbolize of that. The pleasure for taste, the down payment on our inheritance. And in intense picture of his of its full redemption are acquiring and complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. He came for his glory, not your own. Again, God's doing everything. We're just sitting back just receiving. Being changed. Love it. For this reason, now we get off this runoff sentence. The runoff sentence has now ended, but it still keeps going. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not seem to give thanks for you for making mention of you in my prayers. That's my same thing for each and one of you. I give thanks for y'all. I'm thankful. Y'all are here. I mean, y'all come. You help. I'm thankful. Y'all are in Christ. I'm thankful for that. Because you know what? I don't want to be in turn without y'all. And that's our hope. That's why we put those people on our website. That's what it's all about. I don't want to go, I don't want to, go to heaven without missing somebody. I want everybody to come. I want to party up with Jesus with all y'all. I don't get on the dance floor. I can't dance in this body. I sure, I'm hoping I can dance in that body. Right? <laughs> so, I want to dance in that body with all y'all. I'm thankful for you guys. I am. Truly, I am. But I always pray to God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of the Lord, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of the insight, mysteries, and secrets into the deep, intimate knowledge of him. And that is my same prayer for each one of y'all. I pray that God reveals everything to you. I pray that he just opens up the door to see all his grace for each one of y'all. Because I know what? Seeing his grace changes your entire life. I don't like seeing y'all struggle. I love y'all seeing Jesus. And I love y'all just being formed. As a pastor, I've seen so much of y'all. I know, I talk to y'all. I know more about y'all probably than most people else know about y'all. It's, it's kind of interesting, but I love seeing the transformation of seeing that revelation take place. I love seeing it. It's absolutely beautiful. It makes me get out of bed and keep going in the ministry. Seeing that. It's absolutely beautiful. But having the eyes of the heart flood with light, revelation. So that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you. We all have individual callings, right? He wants first ones you see the call that you have, which is to be in Christ. Now, while you're here, he has another calling for you. So he says, I want you to see all of this so that now you have your call. Now I'm gonna show, he's going to show you what he's planning to do to work through you so that everybody else may see him, who he is. And how rich his glorious inheritance is in the saints. And so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited surpassing greatness of his power in for us who believe as demonstrate in the working of his mighty strength or dumas power. His power. Watch this. He wants you to know his power. How did he demonstrate this? Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the grave. And I was just like, what's that power? That power is to show that you and I are justified. That's the only reason why God raised him from the grave. Because he was always the son of God. He was always and he was always blameless. He raised him up to say, you are justified before me. You are right standing with me. Your sins have been washed away, gone. You are wholly blameless in my sight. That's the reason why he, he, um, he raised him from the grave. That's it. That power, that's love. Because man, only love can do that. Only love can do that. His power is his love. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. He sits before God to represent you and I before God. He is all right standing. We're in Christ. I want you to picture that. In Christ. If he see at the right hand, where are you and I see that today? At his right hand. Wherever Christ is, that's where we're at. As he is, so are we in this world. If he's seen a high, we're seeing a high right now. Right now, at his right hand. Right now. Not until we get to heaven. Right now. You start to understand that, man, power starts to flow out of your body. Man, it starts to flow. 
it really starts to flow. Man, because man, nothing has a hold in you now. And we'll keep seeing it. it says that he placed him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and everything that is named above the title that it can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. If he see above high all that, where are you above? The devil has no touch on you. Your sin has no touch on you. Each person has no touch on you. Your circumstance cannot touch you. You are far above it. Far above. I said this before. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. They fell. God could easily just redeem us and put us back in the garden. No, he didn't. He didn't put us back in the garden. He put us high above at his right hand so that we could never fall again. So that he could be with us forever. There was no chance the devil could touch us. That he could try to trick us to get out, to fall again. Now he puts at his right hand so that he can watch over us, that we don't have to fall. Man, that is beautiful. I want you to start saying this. Do you deserve anything else? The answer is no. Okay, we're, we're going to start getting to that portion. And he has put all things under his feet, and he has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church. He's the head of us, right? A headship exercised throughout the church, which his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all for in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete, who fills everything everywhere with himself. We're the church. Are we not gathered to that? We're the church. We're the church. God is full here. His full measure is here. Here. Us gathered together is here. This is why we gather. It's because it's here. When we come together, the devil can't take us. Because the full measure of God is here. You have the hands, you have the feet, you have the eyes, you have everything here. Because the hand can't operate without the eyes. The hand can't operate without the feet. It can't happen right where it is. It can't operate on your own. It's in the church that we come. So what, the, what does the devil try to do? Try to get you not to come. Brings up excuses. Says you need to be by yourself. You're better off by alone. Be alone. Right? Because in that, there's no power. Just by yourself, there's no power. It's when we come together. I don't want to be the only one out there out there in front of abortion clinics telling them that God loves them. I want all of us to be there because that's the church. By myself, I'm not the church. I'm not just alone. When we come together, we're the church. This is just a wall. When we get our own place, it's just a building. It's not church, but we don't go to church. We are the church. It's called church service. This means that the service, we come together, the church together in Christ. Now, I want you to start thinking this. One, two things can happen when you start to hear this. One, you start thinking, I don't deserve any of this, right? Second thing says, man, I must have done something right. One or two things happen, right? Even though, even though we were sitting there and said, God did everything. It never said for you that you did anything. But still, man's fallen mind still comes up and says, I must have did something, right? Watch Paul address this issue. Watch him actually talk about what you have done. I love this part. I love this. Let's go on. And, he, and you, he made alive when you were dead by your trespasses and sins. So for one, before Christ, you were never alive. You were dead, according to God. You were dead. So you only have life when you're in Christ. That's it. Done deal. I don't care what else you try to do in, in this world. You'll never have life unless you're in Christ. He's our life. He's the very air that we breathe. Right? Now, watch this. God, he's going to show us what we have done. You ready for this? You want to see this? In which at one time you walked. Wow. Habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world. We're under the sway and the tendency of this present age. Following the prince of the powers of the air. You were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit. That constantly works in the sign of disobedience, the careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving who go against the purpose of God. And among these, these we as well as you once lived in conducting ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the pulse of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictate by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by the nature children of God's wrath and the heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. He actually tells what we actually did. It was nothing right. He says, first thing to come out, he talked about, about all these beautiful things. So he got, 
God knows the first thoughts that are going to come to your head. Yeah, I don't deserve it, or I do. This, I must have done something right. He actually says, no, you actually did everything opposite, opposite of right. You did everything wrong. He says, you did everything wrong. You were no different than anybody else of this world. You walked that way. You were under the control of the devil. He had you. And you did everything wrong. Right? That's all actually what I do. But I love how God never leaves us right there. This is what I call these but God moments. Because they're always there. He talks about, man, how filthy and how terrible that we did in our walk. But it always comes with but God. But God. Verse 4. But God. But God. He didn't say, but you did something. He says, but God did something. God did it. Not you and I, but God. God. God did it. But God, so rich is he in his mercy. Because of it, in order to satisfy the great, wonderful, and intense love which he loved us. In, in your Bible it says relentless. And actually that's what it means in the Greek. It's kind of, the Amplified tries to tell you the more definition. But his relentless love to you. In order to satisfy his love for you. Ready? Or to satisfy his love. This immeasurable, relentless love that he has for you. He needs to satisfy it. He can't just say the sin to your wrongdoing. He can't just say, I sweep on this rug. I just push it aside. Because he's holy. And he's just. It means what? Sin has to be dealt with. The, the price has to be paid. Right? It has to be paid. But you can't pay it, he says. You can't pay it. So and for me to satisfy my love that I have for you, how do we see his love? How do we find his love? Even when we were dead by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and you with Christ. That's his love. You want to see the thickness and relentless and immeasurableness of his love is what he did for you on the cross. Taking you from being dead and making you alive by putting you in Christ. That's his love. You ever want to dig it back? Look at the cross. God always tells us to do one thing. Just look at Jesus. Look what he's done. That's it. He says, just look at him. We saw that last week. He says, just turn away from everything and just look at him. Look at Jesus. We'll show that next week. Because even before that, in the Old Testament, it even shows that too. It's just looking at Jesus. It's just seeing Jesus. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. The same new life which, with which he quickened for him, quickened him for, it is by grace that you are saved. You are saved not because you did something right, because it's by grace. You're in Christ because of grace. Not because you did something right, because of grace. Period. I was always wondering, why Paul, why'd you always put this here? If you look at it as a whole, you start to see it. He starts to reveal. He says, this is who you are in Christ. This is who you are in Christ. Oh, by the way, notice that God did everything. Look what you did. So you can't sit here and say, it was you that did it. It was you who had blessed yourself with all the stuff and spiritual blessings in Christ. It was you who picked your own self out. It, it wasn't you who ordained yourself. It wasn't you who has forgiveness by you, yourself. You have forgiveness of sins by the riches of yourself. It isn't you. is isn't you. It's by grace and grace alone. Because all you did was dirt and everything bad. But God did all the amazing things. He's the one who did it. Man, I love, I, I love this epistle. Man, I, I absolutely love this epistle. I absolutely love this. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together. I like the word together. Because you know what? We come together as the church. <coughs> Notice this word. He's starting to say all this stuff. Together. Not by yourself. Together. Coming together. Coming together. The church. That's who we are. Giving us joint seating with Christ in heavenly spirit by virtue of, of our being in Christ Jesus. And we just saw that. Where is Christ seated at? At the right hand of the Father, far above everything. And everything is beneath his feet. So where does that make you? He's telling you, he says, this is where you're at. You think about that. You stop and think of where you're at, man, it changes your whole situation, don't it? You, you, think, you think like this. If he's far above cancer, 
any type of disease, any type of circumstance, any financial difficulty. He, he's a far above it's beneath his feet. Receive seat with him in Christ is below our feet. Huh? It means we have power and dominion. We have power and authority over it. We tell it what to do. It doesn't tell us what to do. We tell it what to do. We tell it. Because that's who we are in Christ. Because it's beneath us. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come. He did all this. I love this part, man. This, it's going to take a life. It's going to take eternity to, for us to understand his grace. Because it's immeasurable. Riches of his free grace. In his kindness and goodness of his heart toward us in Christ Jesus. What he did for us on the cross, he says, I want I demonstrate all in there. I want you to take a lifetime to a lifetime or eternity to figure it all out. I want you to know it all. I freely want you to know it. I want you to know what I did for you. That sets you free, don't it? Sets you free. You can actually now relax in your situations you go through. You, whatever you struggle with, now you can just sit back and relax. He did it. He wants to show you that he did it all. He did it. You tell me this. If you ever have something that you owe, how many of y'all have debt? I still have debt, some debt. Right? If somebody came and paid your bill for you and overpaid, will you not be, and you found out about it, will you not be jumping for joy doing cartwheels, probably doing dance if you can't dance? Probably playing basketball if you couldn't play basketball. You'd be doing something you couldn't do before, right? You would just be celebrating, would you not? And, we, and when that happens, let's have a party and we'll all go party together. Seriously. Right? Let's celebrate. That makes you sure. So God says the same thing. I want you to know the debt that I paid. I didn't just pay the price. I overpaid it. He's always, he overpays everything. It's always not just, just meets your need. He over needs me. It's always abundance. We're actually in the Greek, the super abundance, which is way more than enough than we actually ever needed. But that's just who God is. He's the prodigal father, for crying out loud. He's the prodigal father. It means he, he lavished on us. He absolutely lavished on us. He wants us to know all this. He wants us. He wants us to stop trying to strive and do it ourselves. He says, I want you to see it all, I don't I want you to see it, all of it. And I'm not going to hide from you at all. I openly did. Christ was openly crucified outside. He wasn't crucified inside the city. He was crucified on top of a hill, which everybody can look up and see him. He openly did it. So that means that he's not trying to hide it at all. He didn't try to hide from the devil what he was doing. He purposely did it. He did it right in front of him. He laughed at him in front of his face. He says in Colossians that he paraded his victory around the devil right in front of his face on the cross. Wow. Right? So he's not trying to hold back Jesus from you. He's not holding back any revelation from you. He wants you to have it all. Are you ready for it? Are you ready to receive it all? I want it. I enjoy every day he shows me Jesus. And then you're like, man, it, takes me, it makes my heart stop. My heart literally stops for a beat. I kid you not. And I'm still breathing. I'm still alive. That's just the amazingness of his grace, is it not? How about this part? Paul then reiterates again. I repeat a lot of stuff in the sermons. I repeat stuff over and over again. Why? The human nature, your human mind, your fallen mind needs to hear stuff multiple times before you can grasp it. I was always like, Paul, why did you say this twice? He wants you to know this. For it's by grace that you are saved. Through your faith, you're believing in Christ. Right? And this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not of yourself. Of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it's the gift of God. It's a gift. It's not because you kept the law. You kept all ten commandments, which none of us did. And I'm sorry for the rich young ruler that he thought he actually did. And Jesus zipped the first one. He said, you know, you missed the first one, my friend. But I said, love you. You come. 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 It's okay. You be that Zacchaeus in the next chapter who says that, he who stole money from everybody because he was the chief tax collector. The chief means that he was the mob boss. He had his little minions go out there and steal money from the rest of the Jewish people. His own people, his own brethren, he was taking money from. Yet, when one experience with Jesus, he gave it all back plus. But that rich young warrior couldn't give one back because he was so full of pride. He thought, "What can? What do? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? You can't do nothing, my friend." Because it's by grace and grace alone. 
not because of your works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands. Take the law out. The law can never save you. Just move it aside. Lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what, what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Can't do it. When you know that you're saved by grace, you just give praise to God, do you not? Your action is praise. When grace produces always thanksgiving. It always produces thanksgiving. When you see grace, it makes it, what? A praise come out of you. It may be just simply say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. That's it. That's so simple. That's so powerful. That produces thanksgiving. It's grace. For we are God's own handiwork, recreated in Christ. We were horrible, ugly looking on our own. He made us a masterpiece in Christ. You are God's masterpiece. You're not trying to become, you know, he's still not painting it. You're already his masterpiece. Like a great artist, he, a great artist whose masterpiece, they always put on public display. So guess what? He always puts us on public display. He says, look at my masterpiece. Look at it. Look at it. Number, it was 2 Corinthians 2.14 says that we're trophies of Christ's victory. Trophies of Christ. Think about that. It means you're out on display. For the whole world to see his goodness, his grace. And look, he says, look at my masterpiece. Born anew, that we may do those good works. Notice that when he says this, when it's work, we're talking about the law, it's always just work. But everything that comes out in response to seeing God's grace is called good work. It's a good work. Wow. I noticed that. You go back and look at it all. It always says good work. Look in the Greek. Your English may fail you. Sorry. But look in the Greek. It will always be referenced to good work is always referencing his grace, his response, good work, praise. Wow. You're led by the Spirit, not of your own. Hey, you, you're sustained from adultery, not because you're trying to keep the law, because the, you know what, the Holy Spirit is just guiding you not to do it. Put a new desire in your heart. It says, hey, I want you to do this instead. I want you to just love your wife as Christ loved the church. Or I'm going keep to you, keep you from having sex, period. He's the one that does it, not you. That's a good work. It's God's work. Is a good work. Our works suck. It's horrible works. Which God predestined? God did. He did. Again, for us taking paths which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life. I love that. The good life, which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. I know we hear so much music talking about the good life, it's popping champagne and partying and, and all this fun stuff. You know what? God says the good life is this standard, being in Christ. That's the good life. And guess what? You'll be able to dance with the prodigal son, dancing, having the fat, ha eating the best cow out there, eating the best food, having the best fun, and it doesn't compromise you one bit. That's the good life. We have cookouts. We do all kinds of stuff. I told you, when we get our own place, when we physically get our own building, we're having a cookout. We're going to celebrate. We're going to party. There's going to be music. We can dance. Oh, don't be scared to dance, people. Dance is not the devil. Notice that David danced before God. It's holy. It's righteous. Okay? But we're going to have a party. It's the good life. We're living the good life. We're in Christ. God's, he's highly favor us. We're totally forgiven. We're holy and blameless. That's the good life. Is it not? That's the good life. I don't have to worry about anything. It's done. Therefore, remember that one time. Notice this. He's now going to bring you talk about the Gentile and the Jew. Okay? And he's going to talk about there was a division between the two. It was called the law. The law divided between the Jews and the Gentiles. They were separate from each other. The law separated them together. Notice he's going to talk about how Christ brought them together. Ready? Let's go. By the time the Gentiles in the flesh called on circumcision by those who called themselves circumcision. It itself a mere mark in the flesh made by human hand. Circumcision doesn't mean anything. It's the human hands that does it. Guy in Colossians 2 tells us that Real circumcision is made of the spear which God did and put you in Christ. That's what it is. That's, it's all symbol of that. Remember that you were at one time separate from Christ, excluded from all part in him, other estranged and outlaw from the rights of Israel as a nation, and strangers with no share in the sacred compacts of the Masonic promise, with no knowledge of, of or right in God's agreement, his covenant. And you had no hope, and you were in the world without God. So they were separate. The Jews were God's chosen people. Physical people, right? He set them apart. He wanted to raise up a nation that would display his goodness to the rest of the world that they can see. And when Christ is born, they can just go out and preach God's goodness and all the world will come in. And that's God's plan. Okay? They fail miserably, obviously. 
They did, unfortunately. But you know what? God promised to save them all. Hallelujah. Thank you. And he says, but y'all were separated. I was near them. My, my, my presence was in the temple and was with them. It was in with the Gentiles, okay? Notice that they were near Gentiles surround. Anybody hear Jewish background? No. So that means we were far off. Okay? But now in Christ Jesus, you were once were so far away through by the blood Christ had been brought near. For he himself is himself our peace. Notice that Jesus is our peace. He says, the peace I leave you, peace that is not of this world, right? He gave you, he is our peace. What does that peace mean? It means that you're in right standing with God. God's not mad at you. He's not holding anything against you. You have peace with God. He has made us both Jews and Gentiles one body. And it has broken down the hostile divine wall between us. By abolishing in his own crucified flesh the enemy caused by the law with his decrees and ordinance, which he annulled. He annulled. He did. We didn't get rid of the law. He did. He annulled it. He fulfilled it. Done. Push it aside. That he from the two might create in himself one new man. One. One new quality of humanity out of the two, so making peace. And he designed to reconcile to God both Jew and Gentile and united in a single body by means of his cross, thereby killing mutual enemy and bringing the few to an end. And he came to preach the glad tidings or glad tidings of peace. Now it's now the gospel called peace, the good news of peace, to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Alright, let's put this in today's terms. You ready? You ready? Talk about Jews and Gentiles. And let's put this in terms. There is no division between poor and rich. There's no division between races. There's no division between any social society. And then, because Galatians 3.28 says that it doesn't matter who you are, you're all one in Christ. Amen. Stop seeing yourself as division. Amen. He's telling this church, stop seeing yourself divided by the Jews, and they're different, and you're, you're this. He says, no, see yourself as one. So guess what? For us, we're, we're, we're united with the Jewish people. You ready? Simple. Hang with them. Even if they do wrong, hang with them. They're your brother. You're going to be hanging out with them in heaven. Okay? They still have to see Jesus, and God promised they, they will all see Jesus. Okay? They're no different than you and I. They have to believe in Jesus. He says, I promise they, they will. But for you and I, in terms here in the U.S., ready? we got to stop dividing ourselves. we got to stop making one, social, one, one thing social so much higher than the next. And stop dividing ourselves and start uniting ourselves. And how do we unite ourselves? By seeing ourselves in Christ. This is the gospel. Simple, the gospel. This is the gospel. Gospel of peace. As he just said. It's the gospel of peace that brings us together. It's to unite us. He says, you know what? We may have different color skins. You may have different type of hair. You may have different type of eyes. You might be high society. I might be low society. But we're all one in Christ. So we treat each other like that. All lives matter. Every person matters. People now, period. And that's what it means to you and I today. Not just be united with the Jewish people, we can look beyond that. We look at, we're all one. I don't see y'all's color, I see who you are in Christ. You're my brothers and sisters. And we're going to be partying in heaven. So I hope you're ready to party, because I like to party. And we're going to be partying here before we even get there. But we're all one. All one. For it is through him that we both were far off from the ear that now we have an introduction by one Holy Spirit to the Father so that we are able to approach him. Now we have the Holy Spirit, we can approach God in Christ. Therefore you are no longer outsiders, but you are now share citizenship with the saints. And you belong to God's own household. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, in him, not in you, not in what you do, in him, in Christ. The whole structure is joined. We try to go out there and we try to build relationships with people. We try to build a structure that creates what? Unity. We try to say that this is going to make us all come together and be one peaceful world, right? We try to do all those things. He says, no, it's in him we all come together. In him. The gospel brings us all together. But the gospel we preach, how can people believe in Jesus Christ? We preach the gospel to bring us all in one. The church is one. Maybe different types of people all in there, but we're all one. That's it. 
joined together harmoniously. I love this part, welded. Welded means, man, when, when you weld metal together, it don't break. Man, it stays together. I don't care what you do, man. You try to break the welding part. It's like, I, I don't know the chemistry. I'm a science person. I love it. I just don't know what makes it. You know, but I know this much. You can't break a welded spot unless it's poorly put together. And you know what? God doesn't weld stuff poorly, does he? He always does it perfectly. It can't be broken. Take it harmoniously. Harmoniously, it continues to rise into a holy temple in the Lord. It's church. A sanctity, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. That's the church. Church. We are welded together by God. All different types. Welded to God. As a temple to God. Where his presence dwells forever and ever and ever. Amen. In him. Not in you and what you do. Again, in Christ. And in fellowship with one another. I love this. In fellowship with one another. You yourselves also are being built up into the structure with the rest and to form a fixed boat of God in the spirit. And this is where my summer ends, by the way. But, you know how Paul orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, brought us together in Christ. He, he showed us what it meant to be in Christ, and he says, oh, by the way, it's not by your own works. He, he initiated that whole mentality and says, you didn't do anything. Notice that all this stuff, that one, two verses talks about us, and it's not ugly, it's not, I mean, it's not pretty what he said about us, what he's doing. It's ugly. But everything else God did is beautiful. Notice that it took all those verses to explain what God did for us in Christ. Man, it's a lot. You know what? He probably could have kept on writing. But I want you to focus in on that. He blessed us with everything. He hand-picked us in Christ. He picked us in Christ so that we'd be holy and blameless in sight. What does that mean? He can, we could be with him forever. So that we're not going to be left behind. We're with him. He gave us, predestined us to be in Christ. That he gave us, he gave us highly favor in him. So that any six circumstance that comes against us, it, we are favoring. Fit, every odds are against, with us, not against us. He says that you have forgiveness or you have removal of sin, not by your works, but according to the richness of my grace, which I pour out on you in all wisdom and understanding. Who I want you to see to the day that in turn he just keeps on going, going. I want you to learn it all. He says, oh, check out Jesus. Yeah, guess what Jesus did? All his power. I want you to know the power, which is his love, that raised him from the grave. Oh, and I set him high above everything else. And then he goes and says, you know what? You might be puffing yourself up, but you know, I'm going to promise that you did all this, but God did all this. God saved you. God put you in Christ above everything. That's who we are in Christ. Oh, yeah, guess what? You may see division among yourselves when you look through your physical eyes, but I have made you all one. And when you start looking at the eyes of God, man, everything starts to come in together. You start treating yourself so much better. You start treating others better. You start treating them with respect. You stop looking down upon people who you look down upon. You start lifting them up, too. That who you are, too, as well. You don't look at yourself bad either. You stop trying to pull yourself away and says, I just want to be alone. But I'm going to come in and be the church. I'm the church. Let's come together. We're going to come together as one to do what? Tell the world about how God, how great God is. To come together for us to see Jesus, to uplift ourselves. Because you know what? We go through struggles and we see Him, we get uplifted. And guess what? We am doing together. We come back out, we go out in the world, we leave these four walls and we go out and preach the gospel. Together. One accord. So they were one accord, the church, the new church. Why? They saw that. And believe me, that was a mixed church. If you actually do the research, they were a mixed church. The day of Pentecost means all the Jews from all over the world, because they, they were spread out. Man, they had been influenced by their cultures. They weren't all just Middle Eastern. They, man, they were black, every situation you could possibly think of. They were Romans, everything. They all came there. 3,000 of them got saved and became the church. He says they were all in one accord. It means they're, what they looked like on the outside did not matter. They were all in one step. So that's how we should be today. Mm -hmm.